welcome everyone. So, we were discussing projectile motion and uh, in the last lecture uh, we sort of uh, reviewed the difference between the projectiles in real life versus uh, your idealized uh, version in the te typical textbook. Now, uh, here when I say projectile uh, what I have in mind so that you should not think that projectile is simply just a ball that you throw into air but it is also a bird which flies through air or a plane that flies through air or a rocket. So, we cover everything that can move through this is a broad uh, definition. And what we uh, discussed in the last lecture is that apart from gravity there are several other forces that are present and the effect of the air the fluid through which the projectile moves is very very significant on the how the projectile can move, move. And in the last lecture we mentioned three forces the drag force, the lift force and the thrust force. So, we discussed drag force in the context of friction. So, today our first focus is to look at the effect of lift force. So, what is a lift force? So, we will try to understand this is an another effect of uh, the air uh, on the projectile. So, this is uh, what is responsible for. Uh, so, this force is present because of the uh, if the if there is a fluid flow past the projectile and this force is uh, uh, responsible for bird flight of the birds and planes. So, we will take a simple example in which we will look at the something called hovering. So, this is a picture of some bird, it is a very common bird in India, very small tiny bird like this size, it is not very, its wingspan is about 10 centimeter and it is also very light about let us say 10 gram. So, this is called a sunbird and you have seen this bird, they come to the flowers uh, and take the nectars. So, so so, they are very important for pollination of flowers and you have seen that when they are in the uh, taking the sucking the nectar from the flower, they are not at all moving, they are not at all flying, they are standing still at one place in air. So, this motion whereby, so what they are doing, they are rapidly flapping their wing and due to that, they can stand still at one position in air and that is called hovering. So, the goal of this example is to understand how is it, how the bird do that. So, to make things concrete, so here is a question that how much power does a sunbird required to hover? So, we assume certain, uh, uh, the certain uh, parameters about the bird. So, I must mention that these parameters are a little bit guesswork. Uh, so, they are they I mean they are not very accurate, they can be off by a factor of 1 or 2. So, this our goal is to sort of get a quantitative estimate to get a feel about the uh, about the numerical uh, feel about the problem. So, how does the bird stay still or hover at one place? In order, now here again as I said that we can we shall take two different point of views to analyze this problem. So, first point of view is something that is already familiar to us which is like drawing a free body diagram. So, we are going to take the bird as our system and then we will everything else in the surrounding and there are two important uh, forces acting on the bird. So, surrounding will consist of the earth and the air and we will look at the interaction between the bird and the air, bird and the earth and we will draw the free body diagram. So, this is effectively a problem of statics. So, we will do force balance and then we will take as a different point of view where we do uh, we will come at the same result at a slightly different way of looking at it. We will apply the momentum balance. Now, one point crucial point here is that we know the weight of the bird is due to the mass uh, uh, mg, but uh, we do not know how much is the lift force and what is the origin of the lift force? The origin of the lift force is very simple to understand. It is because the, uh, bar, the bird is uh, uh, flapping its wing 
So, it is creating a flow of air downward. So, the bird is transferring momentum to the air. So, and as we discussed before that our principle that change in momentum is equal to the force acting on the system times a. So, if you look at the if you consider air as the system, then the bird is transferring momentum that means the bird is exerting force on the air. Then by Newton's third law, the air is also exerting a force on the bird and this force is the lift force and this force must act in the direction opposite to the weight of the bird to counter and that is the reason the bird can stand still. So, this is one way of looking at the problem. Now, we need to derive an expression for the uh, how much is this lift force. And here I am going to introduce to you a very important quantity because the fluid, the air, uh, because of the flapping of wings of the bird, the air is uh, flowing. Now, when you have some fluid, something flowing, you have a current and there is a very important concept that is used to measure how much some stuff is flowing that concept is called flux. I am sure you have introduced uh, seen this fl uh, uh, flux in various other, con uh, other situations. So, what is flux? Simply speaking imagine that you have a door and this door has some area, area uh, A and then something is flowing through the door. So, and this what is this something? Well, for example, uh, you, if this something is charge, electrical charge, then the flow of charge is called electric current. This something can also be mass. For example, let us say you are watching some uh, the you place some kind of a door in a river so, and water is flowing through the door. So, it could be mass and then this flux of mass is called normal current or mass current. It could be energy such as heat energy. So, imagine that uh, it is a uh, this door uh, the different uh, two sides of the door has different temperature, then the heat can flow from the hot side to the cold side. So, it could be heat and then this flux of heat is called heat current. So, this flux of water you can also think of a uh, shower. Uh, so, when you switch on this shower, the water is coming through these nozzles and there also these nozzles are like acting as doors through which the mass of water is flowing. So, in general some stuff, so all these different quantities I am going to sort of call as stuff something. Then what is the definition? So, we want to quantify the flow. So, what we say is that how much stuff that is flowing per unit area per unit time. So, as you see that more you wait if you watch the flow for an interval delta t, the more longer the time interval of observation the more amount of stuff will flow through this door. Similarly, if the door has a higher cross sectional area, then uh, the more amount of stuff will flow through this door. So, we divide by area, so per unit area per unit time and here note that that uh, I have drawn in a way that the flow is perpendicular to the uh, orientation of the door. If there is some component, so let us say if it is moving in some slanted direction, then all you have to do is that you have to take the component of the flow which is perpendicular to the door. The other component does not count because it is not going to flow through the uh, through the door. So, it is always the flow perpendicular 
to the orientation of the door. So, this is a flux. Now, uh, another way of writing these flux is that which is clear dimensionally is that the stuff flowing per unit volume times the flow speed. So, I am not going to derive it, it is very easy to derive this uh, expression and show that these two are equivalent, but I am just point want to point out that is it clear from dimensional analysis that if I multiply uh, at this equation 1 both uh, numerator and denominator by something at length, then length per unit time will be some dimension of speed and the then the denominator there will be area times length which is length q which have the dimension of volume. Now, this amount of stuff which is flowing per unit volume is called density. So, for example, if my stuff is a charge, then there is the charge density times the speed of the charge that constitutes the flux. If it is mass that is flowing, mass of water that is flowing, then this is mass density that is our normal density times the speed of flow of the water, let us say the water that is coming out of the shower or water that is flowing through here. Uh, through through a river. If it is energy or heat, then this will be in heat density or energy density that is flowing times the uh, speed of flow. So, this is all we need to know for our analysis. Now, look at the this particular problem that of the hovering of the bird. So, then what is this door? What is this door? So, the bird, so this is a schematic diagram. So, the bird I am replacing representing the bird by a cross sectional area of, of area L square. So, some length L and then the cross sectional area is L square and due to the uh, flapping of wings, there is a flow of air downward that is there is a flux of air downward. So, that means in this case what is flowing is uh, momentum and what we need to estimate is the momentum flux. And by our definition this is going to be the momentum density times the flow, the speed of momentum flow. So, the flow speed. Now, momentum is a vector. So, we are talking about, uh, so the relevant momentum is in the downward direction. Why downward direction? Because we are going to see that this is the momentum that is going to balance the weight. So, we are considering the direction in which the gravitational attraction on is acting on the, on the bird. Now, what is the momentum? So, momentum as you know is mass times the velocity. So, in this case assume consider that the downward velocity that is in the z direction is in the downward vertical direction of the air that is flowing due to the So, then the momentum is the downward momentum in the, so let us write downward to sort of emphasize the direction of the momentum will be m times p z and it is a density. So, per unit volume. So, this will be mass per unit volume of the air that is flowing. So, that means mass per unit volume is nothing but the density of the air. So, this is the density of the air 
times v z represents the downward momentum density and the flow speed of momentum is again v z. So, that means the flux of momentum is v z times v z. So, this is rho here v z square. So, as I said that this is the, uh, this momentum is transferred by the bird to the air, which means the bird is exerting a force on the air. So, how to estimate that force? So, what is the relation between flux of momentum and the force? So, let us look at the dimension analysis again. So, if we look at this momentum principle that the change in momentum is force times the interval over which the force is acting. So, if we look at the momentum balance principle, then uh, the, the relation between momentum. So, we find that the dimension of force is momentum by time. Now, if we multiply up and down by area, then uh, what is this quantity in from our definition, this is nothing but the flux of momentum. So, the flux of momentum times the area through which this momentum flux is passing gives you the force. So, we have already estimated the flux of momentum to be rho times rho density of air times the flow velocity square. That means that this force exerted by the bird on air is given by rho air. So, this is rho air v z square times the area which is L square. Now, what is this L? How much is the, what is the area uh, that the bird is having? Is, is it the area of the body? No, this is the area over which the bird is generating the air flow and this is the what is called the wingspan. So, the bird, so the, if you, if it spreads the wing then the tip to tip distance of the wing that is called the wingspan. That is the relevant uh, length over which the bird is able to generate the air flow. So, this is the reason that uh, in many planes the wing, uh, so plane itself is does not have much a cross sectional area, but is some wingspan is usually very large. So, that that is the relevant the, uh, the cross section uh, that uh, the um, over which the lift force is acting. So, this L is the wing span of the bird. Okay. So, now we can say that the force that is the, so now you are able to write an expression of the force by the bird on air. So, by Newton's third, uh, third law, the force by air on bird is also going to be the magnitude of the force, the direction as are now in the upward direction. So, then if the bird is standing still, so now we can draw the uh, free body diagram. So, if this is our box that represents the bird. So, there are two interactions, one is the weight downwards and the lift force by the air and then this lift force we just estimated to be rho air times v z square L square and this must be equal to m g. Now, in this case what is unknown is in this problem the L is given, rho air is given, what is unknown is the 
uh, the mass of the bird is given, what is unknown is the v z, the flow speed that the bird is able to generate and the flow speed will be such that they must be equal. So, that gives, me, gives us an expression for the flow speed due to the flapping of the wing. Now, the question is about the power uh, generated by the bird. So, the power is work done per unit time which is force times velocity. So, if the force is f, the force generated by the bird is f, then the power will be f times v z. So, let us first uh, and then this f in equilibrium due to this equation, we can use either of these expression. So, we are going to use the, the force to be equal to the weight of the bird times the uh, flow velocity. So, let us first calculate the flow velocity. So, given that m is 10, so we are go I am going to use SI unit consistently. So, this is uh, 10 to the power minus 3 kg. I am going to assume g to be 10 meter per second square for simplicity. Then this density of the air is 1 kg per cubic meter and the wing span is 10 centimeter that is 10 to the power minus 1 meter. So, then what we get is 10 to the power minus 2 kg into 10 meter per second square. Again note that I am deliberately writing the units to emphasize that this expression though is not only the numbers but the units are also important because if you change the system of units then the numbers will be also different. And you can check that this kg gets cancelled and the dimension of whatever is in the bracket is actually indeed the dimension of, uh, so this is meter square by second square, square root of that is meter per second. So, this is about so this part, this part gets cancelled. So, this is about square root of 10 meter per second, which I am going to approximate as 3 meter per second for simplicity. So, then the power will be about uh, 10 to the power minus 2 kg into uh, 10 meter per second square into 3 meter per second. And this is uh, in the you can verify the dimension is the dimension of what. So, this is joule per second that is watt. So, this is about uh, 0 0.3 watt or 300 milli watt. So, is it a big number? So, here uh, it looks like 300 milli watt is not a big number. However, we must also realize that the bird has is very small object, it is only 10 gram its mass. So, we should look at the power per mass, per unit mass. So, if we compare power per unit mass, then from this expression what we get is g times v z which is 10 meter per second square into 3 meter per second which is about 30 watt per kg. Now, is this a big number? Now, to make sense of this number, one way to make sense of this number is to compare with what is the uh, human, how much power human can generate. Now, here is an example. Uh, uh, very simple exercise that I give you experiment that I give you as a take home experiment. So, you can easily estimate how much power you can generate by doing the following exercise. Go to a building which is at least 3 story, 4 story high and then find out the stairs 
and then run take a stopwatch and run from the ground floor to the top floor and measure how much time you took. So, the net displacement in the vertical direction. So, you have done work against the gravity. So, you can calculate by how much height you have covered gained by going from ground floor to top floor. So, times your weight will give you the work done by you against the gravity and divided by the time interval that you have followed will give you the power output of your, your body. So, m g times h divided by the time interval will be your power output. So, then if you sort of divided it by your mass that will give you the power output of your body per unit kg. And if you compare that you will find that this number is actually very significant. So, now we are going to look at this problem in a slightly different way. So, so far we have used the free body diagram technique to analyze the problem where we took the bird as a system. There is another way of looking at this problem is that instead of bird as the system take the bird plus the earth plus the air as our system. So, this is a closed system or isolated system. So, there is in the sense that there is no external force acting on if we choose the, if this is our choice of the system. So, then the total momentum is 0, but now you can look at the there are momentum transfer from one part of the component of this system to another part. How? because the earth is giving force exerting force on the bird. So, earth is transferring momentum to the bird. Now, so if the bird does not do anything because of this force because of this force that earth is giving to the bird it will fall down it will simply fall. So, the bird has to transfer this momentum somehow so that it does not fall. So, that is so you can think of this that uh, bird is flapping the wing to transfer momentum from itself to the surrounding air. So, bird is flapping wing transfer momentum from itself to the surrounding air and it is gaining momentum if it does gaining momentum due to the gravitational attraction from the earth. Now, if it is able to transfer the amount of momentum that is gaining from earth full amount to the air, then it can maintain the height and it can hover still at one place in the air. So, this is a slightly unusual way of looking at the problem, but this is a very powerful approach which has uh, you can use in many many different difficult situations. So, you track the mo consider an isolated system and track the momentum flow. So, Again at the steady state, so if the bird is stationary in air that is the hovering, this means the amount of momentum it gains gained from earth. So, this is the amount of momentum that is gained in the downward direction which is m g times delta t in an interval for an interval delta t must be equal to the amount of momentum transferred to the air by flapping which we have just calculated to be times this is the flow and times delta t will give you the total amount shifted. So, if you equate them you get back the same equation. Now, what about to the way momentum that is gained by the air? So, if we ignore all the frictions, so we can simply assume that air transfers this momentum because air is in contact with the earth transfers this momentum back to the earth. So, in our this three component system there is a flow of momentum that goes from 
one component to the another. And this is an example of this momentum flow diagram. Again, the point is that in this way, we may not, you can ignore lot of details about our specific details about the system and still can gain lot of important insight and analyze problems. So, this is the power and beauty of applying the uh, conservation laws, the conservation of momentum, conservation of energy, etcetera. Now, our next example, we are going to look at the third force uh, on, that is important for projectile motions, that is the thrust force. And we are going to look at the effect of thrust force on the rocket motion. Now, again, I am going to emphasize on real rockets as opposed to the textbook rockets. Now, here is an example of an actual rocket. So, this is called PSLV, uh, which is the standard, uh, uh, the most uh, used rocket by ISRO, uh, India's space research organization, to launch satellites in the space. As you can see that it has lot of complicated design and in fact, this uh, the modern rockets uh, which are used to launch uh, satellites uh, have different stages. And if you go to uh, ISRO's web page, uh, the link is provided below, you can sort of get to know more details about the uh, design of the rocket. But the main important point to remember here is that the actual satellite is only at the head of the rocket. It occupies very small portion of the rocket most of the rocket is actually fuel, is a tank for the fuel. Now, what do we mean by a real rocket? So, here is a schematic diagram of a real rocket. As you can see, there are several forces and when the rocket is an example, where all of these forces are important. So, it has a weight. So, the gravitational attraction is definitely important, but in addition, when it is, uh, so the rocket which is taking, I mean, uh, so all the rockets that we launched so far uh, lifts up from the earth's surface. So, it is actually and it moves at a very considered high speed through the air. So, this drag force is definitely important. The lift force also acts on the rocket and of course, the thrust is important to lift the rocket and also in outside uh, in deep space where there is no atmosphere etcetera, that is the only mechanism to accelerate the rocket. So, there are several. In addition, I must mention that look at this uh, extra wing tails. So, because of this, so far we have discussed about the momentum conservation, energy conservation, but the rocket can also spin, it can also spin through the air. So, their angular momentum of the rocket is also very important and in fact, if the in a in a real rocket, if the uh, the uh, if you want to aim for a certain location where you want the rocket to go. So, then you have must consider the spin of the racket and the spin of the racket rocket is because of the torque by the surrounding air on the rocket and this is because of this. Uh, this uh, design of the rocket. So, if you want to know more about real rockets, uh, I have provided a link to a very good uh, place to start. So, this is a uh, web page from uh, NASA's website um, and it has a very complete beginner's note on real rocket motions, which covers uh, all aspects of uh, actual rockets. And the most uh, beautiful part is that it is aimed for first year college students. So, it is not very complicated. So, we are going to take uh, uh, examples of the um, uh, thrust force uh, in the context of rocket motion in the next lecture. Till then, see you. Thank you.